and then a uh, discussion lined up uh, for you this afternoon. Uh, the discussion fits into our wider Euro Growth Initiative and our Future of Europe uh, Initiative. Uh, we're very honored uh, today to be joined by the Honorable Santiago Cabana San uh, Ansonera, who's the new ambassador of Spain, the newish ambassador of Spain to the U.S. He arrived here in September after posts in Algeria and before that the Czech Republic in a long and distinguished career in the Spanish uh, Foreign Ministry. Welcome, Ambassador. Welcome back. Uh, after his remarks, we will hear from Professor Argelia Keralt Jimenez, um, who is the Sarah Hunter Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Barcelona and a distinguished expert on the field of, uh, of de democracy in, in Europe and populist uh, movement in Europe. Um, her remarks will be followed by a fireside chat that will be moderated by uh, Doug Redeker, the founding partner and chairman of International Capital Strategies a senior, fellows, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, a friend of the Atlantic Council, and um, uh, previously, after a long career in investment banking, uh, the U.S. representative on the board of the IMF. Uh, so without further ado, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you all for joining. Good afternoon, and thank you very much. Thank you, Bart. Thank you for your kind introduction. It's always a pleasure to be back at the Atlantic Council, and I really want to thank you all for being here with us today. Um, apart from thanking the Atlantic Council, I really want to thank also Mr. Redeker for joining us and for leading today's discussion, and of course, uh, Professor Argelia Keralt for joining us uh, from Europe. I was going to say from Barcelona, but she's actually coming from Frankfurt because she's working now at the Max Planck Institute during uh, this, this month. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Keralt, for uh, being kind enough to accept our invitation. And the reason why I invited Professor Geralt was because we are celebrating now the 40th anniversary of our Constitution, the Spanish Constitution of 1978. I think uh, this uh, Constitution, which was supported by over 90% of the Spanish people in the referendum in 1978, in December 1978, has really provided the legal framework for what has been really uh, four decades of uh, great accomplishments in, in our country. And I think uh, now Spain is a very open, very free society, a full democracy, as uh, understood by many, many of the democracy indexes in the world. So very proud, we are very proud of our constitution, very happy that we are able to celebrate it uh, in, in, on this occasion. And the best way to celebrate the Constitution of 1978 is to respect it. And I think this is one of the things that we want to do, to respect our constitutions. So thank you again, Argelia Geralt, for being here with us. Um, I was here, I just, I've been here really, uh, as uh, Bart has said, uh, I've just been here for a couple of months, but I had the opportunity to be here at the Atlantic Council about two or three weeks ago. Uh, for the presentation of a book, a very interesting book, called The Era of Perplexity. And uh, it's published by, the, uh, by BBVA, uh, Banco de Bilbao Vizcaya, with the contributions of many experts on what's going on in the world. And I think it's very interesting to read the book and the discussion we had here at the Atlantic Council, seeing um, that for many different reasons, but basically because of the effects of globalization, the transfer of jobs and rent from uh, west to east, and because of the tremendous acceleration of the scientific and technical revolution in the world, we're seeing now a uh, questioning of the values that have been the basis of the world order since the Second World War, and we're seeing uh, really a challenging of the democratic values that have been at the base of our living together in the last uh, four decades. And, and it's important to understand this framework when analyzing what's going on, as Professor Geraldi is going to explain us, uh, is going on in Europe. And the rise, certainly the rise of populism and the, and the, uh, the questioning of representative democracy and democratic constitutionalism in our European continent. Um, in, in Spain, as you know, uh, we haven't had a, to now right-wing uh, uh, populist parties. Now might uh, well be that we're seeing the rise of a, such a party in the regional elections in Andalusia. But we've also seen in the we've also seen some form of populism in what's happening in Catalonia, uh, um, and uh, 
the, this has created certainly a, a very serious institutional crisis in our country, but successionism uh, has been taking increasingly a populist form. So I think this is another interesting issue that I'm sure we will be discussing later. Um, I would like to add, and before giving the floor to Professor Gerald, that for us, for the Spanish government, reconciliation among Catalans remains uh, one of the main priorities, if not the main priority, of the government uh, of the uh, uh, government in Spain. Uh, we must all make an effort to um, uh, safeguard rights for all, successionist and non-successionist, because we do have to normalize uh, regional political life and gain, again, the peaceful coexistence of all Spaniards in all the territory of Spain. So now let me introduce uh, very briefly Professor Keralt. She's a distinguished legal professor in Spain, particularly in the field of constitutional law. She's a professor at the University of Barcelona, where she obtained her PhD. And uh, she's an active uh, researcher and publisher, and she's been part uh, of a monumental effort uh, compiling in-depth studies about the Spanish Constitution of 1978. She is also engaged, uh, an active uh, opinion maker in the press, with articles in the Spanish press, and uh, specifically in El País, with contributions to top media like Cadena Ser and Radio Nacional de España, and with her own online magazine, Agenda Pública. We're very, very pleased and very honored to have you here Professor Argelia Keral, thank you very much, and thank you to all of you. Thank you. Well, uh, good. Afternoon. It is a great honor to be here today. Uh, that way, I would like to thank the Spanish Embassy here in Washington, D.C., and, and to the Atlantic Council in particular for having invited me. Thank you. Um, the reason for my participation on this event is the uh, commemoration of uh, the Spanish Constitution's 40th anniversary. The Spanish constitutional, uh, the Spanish Constitution was part, was sorry, was passed after 40 years of dictatorship. So, in comparison to other Western European democracies, Spain is a young one, a mature one, though. The first ever democratic uh, Spanish Constitution was the Constitution of the Second Republic of 1931. However, it had a very troubled and short life due to the coup d'etat perpetrated by General Franco, the civil war, and the final victory of the rebels. In 1939, an almost four decades of military dictatorship began in Spain. Franco died in 1975 and began what we call the transition, the period of time that transcurred from the death of the dictator of the dictator until the approval of the Constitution of 1978. It has been identified as a worldwide reference as they got to transform an authoritarian dictatorship into a democratic one with a, uh, a democratic state without blood or repression in the hands of the state. The magic word of those days was consensus. Consensus among the political forces, brand new by the way, as they were not permitted during the, uh, during the dictatorship. So, people living in exile would agree with leaders of the Franco regime in order to come up with a democratic constitution. And they did it. On the 6th of September, uh, the referendum on the Constitution was held at, and the Spanish people ratified the draft that had been elaborated by the Parliament during the previous months. The referendum resulted in 88% of voters supporting the bill on a turnout of 60%. The 29th of December, the Constitution was published in the official bulletin of the state and entered into force. Well, 
the key elements of the Constitution of 1978 were, actually they are, the definition of Spain as a social and democratic state based on the rule of law, the recognition of the people's sovereignty from where all the powers of the state emanate, the establishment of a, parliament, a parliamentary monarchy, the definition of Spain as a decentralized country, the provision of a complete and modern system of rights and liberties, including social rights, the recognition also of the normative value of the Constitution and its supremacy over the rest of the Spanish legal order. And last but not least, the open nature regarding the international and the European law. Spain has been deeply transformed since the 1878 democratic constitution and bears no, resemble, no resemblance to what it was like 40 years ago. Currently, Spain is a full liberal democracy based on the rule of law with the division of powers, a system of rights and liberties, as I have just said, and an independent judiciary. As it is shown by different international rankings on democracy, here you have uh, two of them, the Freedom House Index, where uh, Spain scores uh, 90, uh, 94 out of sin, uh, of 100% of being considered as a free state, or the Economist Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index, where Spain appears as a full democracy. Taking into account other sources, for instance, in the field of human rights, the ratio of pending claims per, in, uh, per inhabitant before the European Court of Human Rights in 2017 was similar to that of Belgium, Belgium France, or Denmark, and considerably lower than Italy, Greece, Italy, Greece and, of course, Turkey. It can be said that Spain is a generally compliant state with the European standards on human rights. Our democracy is imperfect, as all others, and it has its problems, some of which are with, with no doubt serious, but it is globally accepted as a full liberal democracy. It is a modern democracy fully integrated into the international and European communities. The Spanish Constitution provided with the, pro the appropriate legal toolkit in order to make it possible for Spain to become, to become a member of the international community and as a turning point, a member of the European Union. Actually, Spain faces many, challenge, many challenges in different fields, and many of them are shared with other countries in Europe, and I would say all around the world. From the perspective uh, of a constitutional lawyer, one of the worst worrisome challenges within the European Union are populism and illiberalism or illiberal democracy, and the tensions that they generate on the rule, rule of law system. These are ideologies, uh, these ideologies, sorry, consider society, as Cas Mude has stated, to be ultimately separated into homogeneous and antagonistic groups, the pure people and the corrupt elite, good and bad. They argue also that politics should be an expression of the volonté générale, the people will, of the, uh, the general will, sorry, of the people. Within this ideological basis, populism and illiberalism do not need for liberal checks and balances or for the intermediation of political parties or other representatives. Consequently, they demand plebiscitary forms of democracy and direct links between the people and the leaders, rejecting the basic rules of pluralism, protection of minorities, and political counterweights, key features of modern democracies. And a last element I will so add to the systematic use of the uh, 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 sorry uh, a last element I would add to these um, uh, key features of the populism and illiberal democracy would be the systematic use of methods of disinformation, the so-called uh, 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 fake news. Furthermore, or maybe due all of it, we are experiencing the appearance, in, the appearance into the political arena of different extremist political parties, coming this time not from the radical left, but from the radical right spectrum 
of politics. In fact, of, uh, in fact uh, some, commentator, some commentators have already said that we are suffering the crisis of the moderate right wing because they haven't been able to stop this increasing extremism and extremist discourses of some of their leaders or affiliates. The ambassador has just explained that for the first time in Spain, we are facing some of these, uh, the, the representation of these extremist uh, parties in our regional parliament. These elements have different impact on each and every country of the European Union, on the representative democracies in Europe, developing also different manifestations. In Italy, for instance, the populist government is challenging the European Union regarding migration and the directives given by the Union regarding the Italian budget. The Home Affairs Minister, Mr. Salvini, is using false data and information and trying to move the basic and most dangerous feelings of insolidarity of the Italian citizens. In Poland, the Constitutional Court has been disempowered by the current government and their allies in the Polish Parliament. The Supreme Court seems to have been safe by the moment due to the triggering by the European Union of so the so-called Article 7 procedure used when a country is, considered, uh, is considered at risk of breaching the core values of the Union. And also the Commission has brought a case before the, European, the, the Court of Justice of the, European, of the European Union regarding the mentioned uh, law of the Supreme Court. As a consequence, and for the moment, Poland has passed a new law, although it has not been signed by the president yet. So let's see how it, it ends. In Hungary, developments threatening the rule of law have triggered two infringement proceedings, one relating to structural reforms in the area of higher education and scientific freedom. You, I'm sure you have uh, heard about the uh, uh, of the um, Central European University moving to Vienna, for instance, and the second infringement proceeding relating to the treatment, uh, to the treatment of non-governmental organizations in Hungary. Another manifestation of populism crossing Europe are the secessionist movements, more concretely, the Scottish uh, secessionism, but above all, uh, the Brexit, which I think could be considered also a secessionist movement, this time uh, uh, separating from the European Union, and the pro-independence movement in Catalonia. I will move on to, the list, to this last movement, the, the one in Catalonia. And first of all, I would like to point out some of the key features of the situation. The pro-independence ideology is absolutely legitimate under the constitutional system. So there have been pro-independence, Cat Catalan pro-independence, also Basque in pro-independence uh, parties in the uh, Spanish parliament since 1978. So they have been always there. The problems are the tools used to defend that, uh, from my point of view, have become populist. Actually, I think uh, it is possible to talk about the populist drift of the pro-independence movement in Catalonia. Obviously, it is a very complex situation, and many elements are intervened. And there are, of, of course, shared responsibilities between the Catalan and also the Spanish institutions. It is a political conflict and needs a political solution. And in the end, it is a constitutional crisis. I will focus now on uh, the last eight, 15, 18 months of the so-called the process, al process. Huh? On the 6th and 7th of September of uh, 2017, the Catalan Parliament passed two laws, the law of the unilateral referendum on self-determination and the transitory law from the Spanish state to the new Catalan Republic, which saw Catalonia's institutional rupture with Spain. This rupture 
already very serious in a democratic context was possible because the representatives of 50 of of uh, uh, because sorry the representatives of 50% of Catalans unilaterally gambled to impose their venture on the other 50% of the Catalan populations since then we have experienced the shortest life of a unilateral declaration of independence ever by the decision of its own promoters we have witnessed some public pro-independence leaders being remanded in custody. Uh, my opinion, uh, not a necessary measure, not uh, for the, uh, above all in the last months. As well as we have seen criminal charges of rebellion and sedition. Again, they are uh, questionable. Uh, on, we have seen also uh, pro-independence leaders fled, uh, that fled uh, from justice, included the president, the former president of Catalonia, uh, followed by the withdrawal of the European arrest warrant, with, uh, which has previously been reapplied for and rejected, although only partially. We have seen the unprecedented application of Article 155 of the Spanish Constitution with regard to, with regard to Catalonia self-government, which implies to um, substitute these, uh, some of these uh, self-government powers. More than a year has passed by, but the current Catalan government is still immersed in an unreal discourse built on misinformation typical of the new ghost hunting Europe, populism. Needless to say, on both sides of the political divide, there are many elements to be analyzed concerning Spanish and Catalan institutions from a legal and also from a political perspective. For instance, and from a legal perspective, it is commonly recognized that there could be some more space for self-government, not only for Catalonia, but for the rest of uh, autonomous community. And also that the constitution needs and deserves an update regarding its system of territorial organization. However, the Catalan pro-independence groups have been offering a false idea of the movement's purpose. It has constantly been repeated that the process is about democracy, when I'm afraid the facts show that it is about independence. And with this aim, the independence of Catalonia, the leaders of the process have been using populist or illiberal tools to try to convince not only the Catalan population, but above all the international community that Spain was about to, to become a dictatorship and, the Catalo and that Catalonia was merely trying to defend its, uh, its rights and the rights of Catalans in uh, face of such policies. I will give you uh, now some examples on these uh, false uh, realities. Well, it should be, uh, there is a no uh, missing here. There are no political prisoners in Catalonia. I live there, you know, and every day. Uh, well, in any case, there are no political, it's okay, thank you. There are no political prisoners in Spain. The pro-independent supporters have promoted the idea that the politicians remanded in custody should not be there because they limited themselves to defending their ideas faithfully and therefore they cannot be charged with any criminal offense. This assertion poses a question regarding the very conception of democratic rule of law. It is true that September uh, 2017 laws, those of the referendum and the uni unilateral, um, the transitional law, were enacted in parliament and without violence. But it is utterly false that they were performed respecting democratic channels. They ignore the minorities in parliament, actually the other majority in parliament. The rights of the opposition deputies were disregarded and parliamentary procedure was deformed beyond all recognition. The 1st of October, an illegal referendum was held without any guarantee and independence was unilaterally declared for a few seconds, but it was unilaterally declared. 
Those responsible, those responsible for these decisions must assume their legal responsibilities, just as they would in any democratic state around us. Maybe not for having committed rebellion, an offense in which it is difficult to classify what happened, but for having broken the constitutional pact of coexistence. Secondly, there has been a total reduction of the concept of democracy that has been understood as voting only. That's why the pro-independence leaders keep saying that it can never be a crime to put out ballot boxes and put uh, in ballots, which it's not, by the way. Neither can be, st uh, neither can be stated that uh, freedom of expression includes everything, also subverting the legal system. This is a conception of a quasi-authoritarian democracy, the law of the strongest. The whole process is based, in fact, on the idea of legitimacy versus legality, renouncing the rule of law. That is actually what allows to talk on the mandate, on the popular mandate of the 1st of October. Thirdly, there is not even that unique and homogeneous population, sorry, Ah, no. Sorry. Here. Uh, thirdly, there is not even that unique and homogeneous population to which the secessionist leaders constantly refers to. Catalonia is very diverse, also in its preferences regarding the referendum and regarding the relation with Spain. As we got the territorial models, here you can see it. Sorry. As we got there, as I said, the territorial models, a vast majority of those who feel only Catalan defend an independent Catalonia, uh, the 88% of them. However, those who only feel Spanish advocate for different forms of integration in Spain. So independence is a, a majoritarian option among those feeling uh, only Catalan, which are the 20% of the population, or only the 20% of the Catalan uh, population. In fact, and although it cannot be compared to the results of a referendum, the results of last elections in Catalonia showed that there were more votes against the uh, pro-independence options than in favor of this uh, option. If you can see there, I mean, there are difference of more or less 200, 2,000, 2,100 uh, uh, votes uh, of difference between the two options. There is not a unique and homogeneous population in Catalonia claiming independence. At most, 49% 40, uh, of citizens support it. Of course, such a percentage is considerable, and that is why the situation deserves a political answer. So we cannot do anything. We have to react. But 49% 40, uh, is not even a great majority of the population of Catalonia. The drama behind this scenario is that Catalonia is currently experiencing an absolutely polarized, uh, polarized situation. And, not, and last but not least, I would like to highlight the inexistent right to self-determination of Catalonia, although that is what keeps saying President Torra, our current president. The majority of the international, uh, the majority of the international legal experts state that Catalonia is not entitled to the right of self-determination because it does not meet the requirements established by international law. So, in a democratic state as Spain, it is understood that self-determination does not imply secession. Actually, the recognition of the current situation of self-government in Catalonia would be one of the, of the ways to fulfill so, uh, self-determination while respecting the territorial integrity of Spain. A different thing is to defend that in the face of the evident political problem existing in Catalonia regarding its accommodation in Spain, it should be considered that democratic principles advise that such a problem must be solved through the application of political tools. One of these tools could have been a consultation or a referendum. However, it must be borne in mind that such a decision must be taken by means of an agreement between the central government 
and the autonomous government. In a democratic context, unilateralism is not accepted. The Spanish government, led now by Mr. Pedro Sánchez, has changed the way of dealing with the Catalan crisis. However, they cannot stop the criminal proceedings against the secessionist leaders, neither can, be the, neither can the government compel the judiciary to release the politicians remanded in custody. It would be against the division of powers. But while the proceeding unfold, politics should govern the relationship between the Spanish government and the Catalan government. In the judicial field, the, the, they should, judges should uh, scrupulously, uh, scrupulously respect Spanish criminal law in order to administer justice, not some kind of revenge. In any case, thanks to the democratic nature of Spain, every, every, every warranty will be applied, including the protection provided by the European Court of Human Rights. To sum up, the Spanish Constitution has boosted a democratic legal order and a democratic society so solidly integrated in the European Union. And for sure, it needs some unrelevant updates to revalidate its integration faction among the different sectors of society. In any case, we must reinforce its essential nature, the legal, transna the legal translation of the living together social agreement. Thank you very much. Okay. No, no, you're on the answer. Thanks. Well, I had um, planned a whole lot of different questions, but actually having heard the presentation and seen the slides, I'm going to start, if I may, with a couple of um, questions or, or discussion prompts based on some of the actual language you had in your slides. And I do want to emphasize that uh, the word no was supposed to be in that political prisoner slide. So uh, anybody who took a screenshot, I'm here to validate the fact that that's not what you meant. Um, so. There, there are sort of three, maybe four different layers to populism as this session is supposed to uh, cover. One, as you specifically highlighted, the Catalonia situation. Two would be Spain more broadly. Three would be Europe. And four, let's just throw it out to the world because globally we've got a populism problem, however we want to define it. Unfortunately, we only have about 35 minutes and I'm going to throw the conversation open for questions. Uh, for about 15 minutes at the end. So I'm going to try and cover, we are going to try and cover as much of that as we can in a very short time. Let me start with, um, you used the phrase people's will mm -hmm. to describe populism. Uh, so the world is a complex place and becoming more complex every day. So how do you balance representative democracy where people are supposed to vote for individuals whose job it is, is to learn about issues and then infor on an informed basis make a legislative decision versus direct populism reflected by the people's will. And I'm going to use, again, you had your highlight of Brexit and your comment was simply one word, textbook. <laughs> um, and I, I would agree with that, but textbook example of why referenda are dangerous. So let me throw it to you and say, how does the people's will, whether in a good way, people's will seems like a pretty fair starting point for democracy, versus the complex world we live in, how do you balance that? Where's the good part of populism and where's the extremely dangerous part? Well, thank you. Um, actually, I would say that populism has no positive uh, part. Um, so, um, of, of course, our uh, current modern democracies, representative mo uh, democracies, they do not as, uh, as well as they should, uh, as, as good as they should, that's for sure. And I think that uh, many of us, we would agree that they need some uh, reforms in order to deepen the ways that citizens can uh, impact directly on the uh, decision, the, take, the decision process, uh, the, the decision-taking process, right? 
But uh, the thing is when you, uh, you just avoid having this intermediation no, about, uh, among, uh, or between leaders and people, because uh, then you lose the, the perspective of, as I said before, minorities, different interest groups in in, uh, within the citizenship, because as you said, we are everyday more complex societies. No? And I think that it's not possible to have a black or white or yes or not answer to many questions. Uh, so referendum, for instance, I don't think is a good solution for many questions. Uh, one year, two years, re referring to Catalonia, and then I will go to Brexit. Uh, referring to Catalonia, for instance, two or two, one or two years ago, or even three years ago, I, wo I personally was defending that a referendum could be an agreed and legal referendum, of course, could be a good uh, tool to. Uh, uh, to, to, to break the, 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 well, the situation uh, re regarding the relation between Catalonia and Spain. But nowadays we are so polarized that it, it, it wouldn't be a good option. So um, polarization is not a good context in order to, uh, to, uh, to develop this kind of yes or not black or white solutions because then uh, I always tell to my students, we almost we all uh, live uh, most of the time in the gray. So um, it is important to keep also the gray. And Brexit, actually I was not referring to the referendum, but uh, I think it was a very a, a clear example of the disinformation campaign of fake news. No? And how leaders, these populist leaders that uh, should be the solution, the saviors <coughs> of the some, no, somehow the saviors of the democratic situation. Uh, afterwards, they recognized they were lying and nothing happened. So, uh, well, they are not, uh, they, 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 they have been not uh, uh, responsible. They, they haven't uh, paid their responsibilities for this can, uh, uh, because of the, uh, why, uh, oh for the, the campaign they developed, when everybody was saying, no, that's not true, but the black or white responses, the good and bad uh, uh, discussion, well, won. So I, I live in Washington, I have no frame of reference for a political campaign where there were half-truths and falsities. <laughs> no. <laughs> we'll talk I'm about sure. that later. Um, but, uh, but actually that leads exactly into the next question I had written down here, which is, can populism thrive on facts, or does it require half-truths and disinformation? And if so, or if not, um, is it still the same populism that you're describing? Well, uh, nowadays, every country, every uh, politic uh, con uh, context, every politician, I think, that is exercising some kind of populism, all of them. No? Because they think that uh, this, uh, what I said, it is not a good thing for democracy, white or, uh, white or black, they are using it many times. I think the, the problem uh, comes when you try to reveal the system on this kind of black or white. And of course, if you shape the whole thing in this bad, good, yes, no, black or white, you have to... Uh, uh, rewrite the facts. That's obvious because facts. I mean, not this. Uh, now we are. Uh, uh, you s you watch TV and you can see these fact checking uh, uh, well, tools and everything. But then you need the context. You need an analysis of the situation. So, and I think that the populist uh, populism as an ideology, not uh, as a concrete tool that some polit uh, politicians may use. Uh, have, uh, has this problem that they are losing the, the, the full picture, the an overview, and uh, they are not taking into account every fact, just those who are, uh, well, who uh, that uh, defend their position. So that's what I think that populism as an ideology is not a good thing. 
or it's not, it has not a positive perspective because it, it is necessarily built on uh, disinformation, fake news, uh, this uh, idealized, idealized, would you say, yeah. idealized idea of people as good human being, all of them having a reasonable and you no know, having the truth, and that's not true. No? And we have a, there is a philosopher, a Spanish uh, philosopher called uh, Daniel Inerariti. Uh, he is uh, has been writing a lot on. Uh, on precisely on the complexity of the uh, current, uh, the nowadays democracies, and mm, how we need uh, more negotiated solutions for every kind of uh, politic and policy. All right, I'm going to move um, from the broad populism, we'll come back to that if we have time, to Catalonia in particular. Um, simple question. And I'm sure it's a very complicated question, and as we just heard, um, there's no black and white. What do those supporting Catalan independence want? want? Is it, what do they want? Okay. Is it economics? Is it identity? Is it simply a political power grab? What is motivating Catalonian uh, efforts for independence? Well, the pro-independence movement is a very complex one. And I guess that, but I know because I have seen the, the, the data, uh, that there is an identity question, there is an economic question, there's a self-government, more power question. Uh, so there are different elements intervened. Uh, and um, also there are uh, pro-independence uh, voters, for instance, that, uh, that, that have been pro-independence since ever. Uh, then we have the, the new pro-independence voters, and I'm sure that they, they have different uh, reasons to be uh, pro-independence. Uh, the, the, the main thing, would, the, the main uh, aim would be to have more power, uh, more go uh, self-government, actually the self-government, to be sovereign. Uh, but then we have an amount of voters that uh, have... Uh, become pro-independence uh, supporters as a way to, uh, to, to press the uh, Spanish government to give more power to Catalonia. So that's why I think that uh, if the government, Spain or the, Spain, as, uh, Spain has no legs, but well, Spain, you know, uh, uh, would offer a uh, 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 more, not more devolution, no more competences, because we have a very high uh, decentralized country, but a very uh, a better management and a better um, uh, distribution of these competences. Some, I don't know if many, but some of the nowadays for independence voters would move to the, uh, for instance, uh, to a federal option. Uh, so it is not a, a, a static uh, group of people. It is not. It has changed. Actually, uh, 20 years ago, the pro-independence uh, options in the political arena was around 10%. Uh, it has increased a lot in the last years. All right, last question on Catalonia. Um, in your slides, you had a phrase, political conflict requiring a political solution. Mm -hmm. and you put that into bold letters. When I do a slide and I put something in bold letters, to me that's sending a message that it's this, not that. Mm -hmm. What would be the that? You said it's political solution, political conflict, as opposed to what? Well, I think that um, there has been um, a small space for politic, for politics, in uh, under the previous government, as uh, Mariano Rajoy, the former president, had uh, a sentence uh, that says about the referendum. On the referendum, it was: "It is not that I don't want to; it is that the constitution does not allow it." But then, many constitutional constitutional lawyers. Uh, important and relevant, relevant constitutional lawyers have already said that it could be allowed under the, the 
current uh, constitution to celebrate a legal, again, a legal and agreed referendum. Huh? Uh, so, obviously, uh, doing a generous interpretation of the constitution, and actually the constitutional court, the Spanish constitutional court, has not said, no, it's not possible. It, it would be possible with, it, it hasn't said that, that so clearly, but you can read that it was said that it would be possible if some requirements would be, uh, would be, uh, would be fulfilled. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, when I uh, did this from a political point of view, and then I think there is a, regarding Catalonia and also Spain, we have a problem uh, with the reform of the constitution. It needs to be updated, that's for sure. And uh, there is not an agreement among political parties because of one of the, problem, uh, the, the no problems, but the a new situation in the Spanish Parliament that has been that is uh, developing also in the rest of uh, Europe is the fragmentation of the of the Parliament. So it's not uh, blue and red, but blue, red, uh, grey, uh, orange, uh, many colours, and then we have the national, the national nationalistic parties. So. Uh, there is not an agreement among them on the necessity to reform the constitution. And obviously, if you would, if the government would, or the Spanish institutions would offer a reform of the constitution, uh, clarifying the uh, powers of the autonomous community or regions or states, uh, uh, and the, the, center, the central state, I think it would help uh, it would help uh, it would help to solve the situation obviously not from today to the next day but in a, it would uh, it would be the beginning of a new uh, of a new f uh, phase of solution i guess All right, so so let, let me move from catalonia up to the spanish level and this is not meant to be an exploration of Spanish politics, but until a couple of years ago, you had PP, you had PSOE, they were the dominant parties. Now you have a much wider range, Podemos, mm -hmm. Ciudadanos, um, you have a bunch of different parties. Give us a sense of where the political system has evolved up to now, where it could be going, and how that dovetails with this whole rise of populism, whether it is fact-based or um, less than fact-based. Is that, is that a manifestation of anti-establishment corrupt elites, or is there something else going on? No, actually, uh, uh, the, the, the Podemos was uh, a reaction uh, against the, uh, the, the economic crisis and the, um, the, the poor ways uh, existing under the uh, the legal order in uh, to uh, allow people to um, participate more directly in the public sphere. Huh? Uh, so there was um, they were seeking more democracy, huh? more uh, new ways of participation. Okay, uh, uh, this is Podemos, and then Ciudadanos. Actually, it, it one of their uh, their aims was to be a separate, a new party, a uh, liberal party, but uh, renewed and uh, free of corruption. Huh? So these are two elements that have uh, reshaped the Spanish uh, scenario. Actually, uh, two weeks ago, or last week, we had these uh, regional elections in Andalusia, and for the first time, there was this uh, uh, extreme right-wing party who uh, who has uh, passed from not having any representation, but it was not a political party actually, uh, to have uh, 12 out of 90, I think it is, well, no, more or less, well, uh, more than 10% of representatives in the Andalusia parliament. So obviously this global uh, populism 
is having its own reactions in everywhere and in Andalusia in Andalusia and Vox it is called Vox is uh, this political party uh, Catalonia the the the, man, the management no? the 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 the, the, well, the 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 way it has been treated or the, it has been dealt with uh, has had a, an an impact on the people from from Andalusia and this polarization I was talking about, uh, we have now the Catalan identity and well in Andalusia and represented by Vox many of Andaluces no, have said well now I'm, I want to reinforce my Spanish identity so uh, of course it is, uh, the, the, it is uh, the same phenomenon no? but with different translations and manif manifestations. So, so let me um, bring it up a little bit higher now to the broader pan-European uh, landscape. How would you distinguish between populists, mm -hmm. separatists, and anti-establishment movements and parties? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, hmm. we did not reverse this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that uh, separatists does not need to be populist. I think it's a legitimate ideology. I think that, uh, well, you can legitimate uh, think that you would be better alone. Well, as a region in the world, uh, for me it makes no sense today where, I, you know, where we are absolutely globalized. But I mean, I think it is, it, secessionist is not the same as populism can be anti-establishment if it is like a reaction to the, to the establishment, to the elites. But again, it depends on the tools they use to defend their, uh, the secessionism. And that's why I, th I said that the pro-independence is not a populist uh, idea. It is the tools they are using. The same in the, the, Scottish, uh, the Scottish secessionist movement. It's not populist uh, or not, not all, not, not, no, there is not an equal, uh, rel there is not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then anti-establishment, I think uh, they could not be populist, but actually I think if we have, if we, uh, if we write a list of the anti-establishment parties, most of them are populist because they are presenting the bad elites that they are taking decisions uh, on our name and not taking into account any of our interests and they are just uh, uh, defending their own interests. Well, actually it is not like that, or not in everywhere it's like that. And then uh, I think that as, as citizens we have to take uh, also we, we should reflect on how we have been uh, acting during the, the years of uh, well-being of uh, where there was a, a good uh, economic <coughs> crisis. Uh, where were we? So were we acting as responsible and committed uh, uh, citizens, or where we were just uh, uh, letting them, the bad elite, uh, taking decisions in our name. So uh, I think that uh, anti-establishment anti -establishment movements, uh, well, they they have some populist uh, features because I think they don't see the the whole the, the whole picture. So let me bring it up now one layer higher. We haven't mentioned the word immigration. Mm -hmm. We have mentioned the word corruption and elite. So I would argue that a lot of the political movements that are, whether anti-establishment or anti-whatever, mm -hmm. um, are driven by today, and this includes in the US, some combination of a frustration, if not an outright mm -hmm. antagonism and anger at the so-called corrupt elite, the entrenched people who are not representing us the way they are supposed to, and also a deep-seated sense of identity which is transgressed by immigration. Mm -hmm. People who don't look like me, who don't sound like me, who don't whatever like me. So taking it up to the populism as the theme of this, this event, um, how do you see the, the dynamic that I just described? The anti-establishment, anti-elite, they're corrupt, and the anti-immigration because they're not like me. Hmm. Well, it's 
is a bit the, the same thing. When we talk about, uh, I'm not an expert on Im uh, immigration, but for instance, what we are seeing in, in Europe regarding these uh, people fleeing, fleeing from you know, the, the wars of misery and crossing the Mediterranean uh, Sea with, uh, well, ships would be a luxury for them. No? But in any case, um, uh, it has been said that uh, they, they come to the European uh, Union or to whatever country to rob uh, from us our social services, for instance, that, that they uh, get uh, grants or economic help from the state that we do, not, uh, we do not get. But in fact, that's not true. It's again the same thing. I mean, of, 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 of when we criminalized every person not being like us. Um, and of course, if you take profit of it and you convince uh, the population that they are all bad people, uh, they will all rob from us. They will go, I don't know, to our uh, doctor and it will make that we cannot go. But th th I think that we need a lot of uh, ped pedagogical uh, uh, discourse and tools. Uh, but again, it's a complex, very complex situation. And the regular, normal uh, population <coughs> Maybe they are not so interested in this complexity. The thing is that citizens, we want to our, our we want our problems to be solved, and they don't want to be. Or they, they want to. It's a generalization, huh? but we have our work, our families. We we don't we don't want to see if he's saying or she's saying the whole truth or this data is not correct because I have seen the index, whatever. So. But then uh, our politics, uh, in the end, are the a representation of our societies. I mean, they are not uh, bad because, and that's why they uh, de devote their lives to politics. No, they are a uh, reflect a uh, representation of all of us. And so I, I think in these complex democracies, it should be, it should we we should make a big effort in trying to have a better public debate to improve the public debate. Um, by the way, that's why we create Agenda Publica, this, uh, this online magazine, in order to give not opinions, but facts and figures in context. Again, because if you don't give the context, you don't give an analysis. Mm, facts and figure are, figures are nothing at the end of the day. Uh, but I mean, it's very complicated, and because our population are very heterogeneous, so it's not a, an easy situation. But I think that we should ask our politicians to at least respect the minimum, uh, the minimum, minimum standard of non-populist uh, uh, behaviors. But I don't know if it's asking too much. I don't know. Okay. Again, I live in Washington, so I have no comment on that. Um, I'm going to uh, ask one more question, then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, uh, uh, that question, and again, it's, it's not necessarily one that you're going to have an answer to, is, is there a means by which to address some of the underlying pressures leading to what you've been describing, whether in Europe, in Spain, or everywhere else? Is there a means to address it by changing the technical means by which our political system works. So what I mean by that is, if you've got, um, in, the, in the UK, for example, you have first past the post. So it is almost impossible under the existing British electoral system to dislodge Labour and the Conservatives. Even if a vast majority of the people think that the parties do not reflect their uh, perspective. That's just one example, but many countries have these you know, entrenched political systems mm -hmm. that are not necessarily seen by the voters, by the people, by their populations, as legitimate reflections of their view. So is there a means by which we can address some of the pressures that populism is exerting by changing, and I'm not suggesting this is easy or even feasible, but could we even academically think about changing the political system, the electoral system, to address some of these drivers of frustration and, and um, populism. For sure, but I don't think that we can imagine a 
global or uh, a full review of the political system. First of all, democracy is imperfect. We are humans, we do democracy, democracy is imperfect. So there is not a perfect democracy, nowhere. And, and then, for instance, for Spaniards, seeing the, the, the accession of the, uh, of the parliament, for us is wow, because they speak, they, they, they speak very vividly, vividly you say, uh, vividamente, uh, vivid, lively, well. They, they can ask, they can answer. It is not, in Spain, it's much more, much more formal. You have to send the question to the representative, blah, blah, blah. No? And so for us, it would be a, a, a good change to make our parliamentarian, parliamentarian life more lively, OK? So for us, it would be a good thing. Uh, it is in Britain, in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, another change would be needed. So, and of course, but then uh, sometimes the the system, the, the political system, the electoral system, uh, is an answer to a more general system. So it's not that you have to change just the, the electoral law. It's that then you have to change the political parties. That I think they are a big problem or a big issue. Let's say yeah. it's a big issue. Okay, political parties uh, all around, the role they are playing in our democracies. Uh, so it's like you have to change many things. And I don't want to be uh, like conformist, but I think we have to be pragmatic with our democracies. And then it's a question of priorities. Of course, you cannot change everything. So you have to choose, and you have to choose what to do first. Uh, and it's a long time procedure. I think it's a never ending uh, procedure of uh, improvement. So. Great. Okay, on that note, um, I don't know, Bart, do we have any traveling mics or are they just, yes. yes we do. Okay, then we have a traveling mic. So I'm gonna, I'll go to the gentleman waving the, the piece of paper over there first. Uh, and by the way, please identify yourself and Timothy make it a question. Powell, uh, 30 years in the State Department, political officer from Jack Kennedy through uh, Bill Clinton, and now I'm in the swamp. <laughs> uh, fabulous professor, and I want to ask you a question about you're talking about Catalan identity and Spanish identity, and you had a wonderful diagram there, people Catalan 100% and then this, 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 and somebody in the middle and down towards Spaniards. In my 30-year career, I started in Valencia, see, mm -hmm. I see you had a theta then. <laughs> Valencia, Spain, Madrid, Spain, and then the Spanish desk for forever. In my day in Valencia, my first time I looked like a child, so I hung out with the progressives. I don't say left-wingers, that's rude. So they were really anti-Franco, anti-Falange, and we're getting in trouble all the time. I was a kid, I went to the university and hacked and talked to them and drank with them. I went to the art galleries where the Equipo Cronica, which is big mm -hmm. in Spain, left wing, anti Yankee, of course, and poetry and everything. But you had those kind of people were Valencianistas, mm -hmm. and they used that language and that culture to beat up on Tio Paco, Francisco Franco. And the people who are 100% Spaniards, the Dukes and the Condes, they're out and they're, they're playing polo. To what extent do you have that anti-Franquista Catalan stuff still left? Or are those guys in heaven or ancient as I am? Go for it, yeah, enough? sure. I'm not sure if I understood the question, sorry. Uh, Catalanistas uh, are anti Frankistas. Well, many of them, because many of the Spanish and Catalan populations is, is anti Frankist. Well, were, because Franco, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, fortunately, fortunately, well, luckily, uh, died 40 years ago, so we get rid of him. But, uh, but uh, then uh, there are Catalan, I mean, the Catalanist movement uh, defends the identity of uh, Catalonia as being 
or having uh, different and specific features uh, that other parts, regions, people from Spain do not have. So, uh, and during, uh, during the Franquismo, during the dictatorship, for instance, Catalan could not be speaked. So um, Catalan was, uh, was uh, banished from the public sphere. In the private, the families, they kept speaking uh, Catalan. So in principle, Catala the Catalanists should be not Franquistas. But I have to say that uh, uh, during Franco regime, there were some Catalan Catalanistas because they are Catalan, not Catalanistas, that they were collaborating with the Franco regime. No? But I would say that the, uh, the, the media, the, the, the majority, it's not a Franquista, not at all. Okay. There you go, anybody on this side, okay? Um, I'm just going this side, this side, so uh, the young lady over here, sorry. Okay, we're gonna take, we have five minutes left, so we're gonna take two or three questions because I do what I'm told, okay. So Hello, first. my name is Ona Spreenberg. I'm a Catalan-American. Just graduated from UCLA. I wanted to ask you a question regarding populism because I think it's very problematic um, when you group Vox with the independent movement. And then my second question would be as a legal scholar and constitutional lawyer yourself, you talk about the possibility of conversation um, between the Madrid government and the independence movement. That has been tried and nothing has happened, so do we need to just give it time? When is the Spanish government going to do any kind of effort to start this conversation? What's the time frame, more or less? Okay, first question. Second question. This gentleman back here. I'm Steve Winters, independent consultant. Uh, when you were talking, this is a question about the international standards. Uh, I believe there was a case brought before the, uh, is this right, the Inter uh, International Criminal Court of Justice uh, regarding the Kosovo uh, succession, uh, and the, the, the ruling came out about 2007, and basically, I'm sure you're familiar with it, said, yes, it was a valid uh, sp split off from Serbia, even though it violated the constitution of the state from which the successionist group split off. So that the fact that the, the, their, their succession was in violation of the Constitution didn't invalidate the validity of the succession. So uh, it, it, could you give us a, your take on that situation? Of course, not everybody accepts that validity. Okay, we're going to have two more, and then you're going to answer all of them at once. Uh, I'm Harlan Ulm, Senior Advisor at the Atlantic Council. Could you please tell us what you mean by the term populist and populism, and how that's a distinction? I could argue that Jeff Davis was a populist, but I'm not sure that would fit. Okay. And last one, gentleman in the front row, sir. Yep. Hi, I'm Philippe Gelly with the French Daily Le Figaro. Um, you, you present populism mainly as a manipulation of the masses, and I tend to agree with you, but uh, in France, we have this movement of the yellow vest. They have no leader, no spokesperson, not even a set of clear revendication. Uh, they look to me as a Trumpian crowd uh, looking for a Trump. Uh, how does it fit in your uh, analysis of, of populism? Thank you. OK, over to you. Luckily, you had a pen, so you could write down <laughs> some of the points. Well, four minutes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, populism, box, and pro-independence. Obviously, they are very different, but they share some features. That's for sure. Yeah, they don't. They obviously their their aim and their objectives are, are quite different. Uh, but again, not talking about the ido the ideologies behind them, but the tools they have been using. Uh, for for me, box is an illiberal party, directly. It, uh, the pro-independence, not yet. Again, by the tools they are using. But I mean, these are uh, features that uh, that are shared by ma many other uh, political parties all around Europe. And the difference is that the pro-independence movement it's not a political party. It's two, at least two or three political parties, a civil society movement. So that's what I, I speak about the movement, not a political party. 
Maybe the, the parties, the political parties, one by one, they are not populist, but the movement, the movement itself is using populist uh, tools, for sure. And then uh, the dialogue. You, you were talking about the efforts of the Spanish government. And I would say, what about the efforts of the independentist uh, government, the government of Catalonia? Because uh, when uh, Puigdemont said referendum yes or yes, referendum no matter what, I don't think it's a way to, to dialogue. I mean, to, 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 to begin a dialogue, you cannot put your... Well, but I mean, you, ha you have to accept that the Spanish uh, government has the same legitimacy as you have to defend that, there is, that politically they don't want a referendum. Your opinion can be another one, but it is under the Constitution, it is legitimate. legitimate, legitimate. But uh, then when you try to dialogue, but you say, no, but I, would, I, I just want to talk about the referendum the same that is doing the, uh, the, the current president, Torra. No? Well, or when you say, no, I, I'm, 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 I'm done with the Spanish government. Well, it's kind of difficult to ask for an effort of the Spanish government when you are saying, no, I don't recognize the Spanish government. No, well, I, the, the situation is very, very polarized, that's for sure. I mean, and I think that uh, the, the, the context right now, the political context, uh, it has gone too far. Huh? And now we have to rebuild some breaches, but not to find the solution, but to begin to talk frankly. So we have to go backwards and backwards and to begin step by step. And obviously, we need efforts for both sides, but frank, uh, honest uh, efforts from the Spanish institutions and from the Catalan institutions. But in the end, the citizens are the ones who are uh, affected uh, by, the, by the whole thing. Uh, then Kosovo, well, but Kosovo and Catalonia have nothing to do. We have no dead people. There is not a war. I mean, I think that remedial association uh, uh, that was applied in Kosovo and also in Sudan, it's not applicable in Catalonia I mean, because the context, the scenario has absolutely nothing to do. We don't live in a, a dictatorship. There is, uh, as again, there is no a dictatorship killing people or uh, saying that or uh, uh, rejecting rights of people. It's not the, 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 the situation in Catalonia. So our situation is Scotland, it's Canada, it's not Kosovo. So we have to, we have to get a political solution. With a referendum, not right now. I think today it's not the solution because we would be 50-50 once again. And I mean, you cannot live uh, in a permanent 50-50 uh, uh, well, circle right? you, because you have to, go, you have to, 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 to imply, to, to apply politics, you have to, sol to solve the problems of the people. So, but uh, again, I mean, Kosovo, it's not a reference for, for the situation uh, of Catalonia, luckily, again, uh, uh, luckily. Uh, populist and uh, uh, um, populism. I would say populism is the ideology, the, the conceptual basis of uh, uh, the framework, uh, the principles and values of uh, determinate uh, ideology and populist is the person applying those, uh, those set of values or those set of uh, principles. So I don't know if it was the, uh, the question or not. No. We're okay. running, but we're running out of time. Uh, we've actually run out of time. So I'm going to ask for the, that to take place bilaterally. Uh, last okay. question. Sorry. Uh, Gilet Jean. Uh, Populism, I don't know. Uh, you described uh, the situation very well. Huh? Well, you're French. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know the situation much well, but you know the situation much better. But the thing is that it is a, 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 a big and transversal, it seems, uh, movement. Uh, of uh, mm, rejecting some kind, some uh, policies, policies of the Macron government, 
Actually, the Macron, Macron itself is a movement, or it was uh, considered to be a movement, uh, because it, he has not a political, no? a traditional political party structure behind him. And I think that now he's uh, missing it a lot. Uh, and, but then we have Macron, uh, we have, sorry, we have um, uh, Marie Le Pen, and we have Mélenchon trying to uh, dominate no, this, uh, the, 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 the movement to make them uh, their own movement. So I don't know how it doesn't work. Mm, I think it's maybe it's a good thing that it doesn't work. It's an independent movement. <laughs> but actually, but, but the, the thing is that it's at least seen from the outside, it's seen a very violent movement it does not help. But uh, again, one of the things I have learned with the, with the Catalonia, Catalonia well, conflict or crisis is that from the outside, it is very easy to uh, uh, make great uh, statements, uh, big statements and very firm statements what is, uh, on what is going behind your, fr your borders. And the complexity, again, you have to see the whole thing, the whole details to fully understand what is uh, going on. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank the Atlantic Council. I want to thank the professor. I want to thank the ambassador. Uh, all of you, ro robust conversation. Lots more to come. We could, could, have, could have gone on for another hour or so. Um, I encourage you to attend the next one of these things that Bart invites you to. But thank you all for coming. Thank you.